In the last plant lab, we covered the basics of stem architecture for a non-monocot plant. Xylem on the inside of the vascular cambium, phloem on the outside. And you saw how this one tiny population of undifferentiated cells, the cambium, gives rise to large amounts of plant tissue, especially the xylem. Now, in an herbaceous stem like Medicago, the center is often hollow, an air-filled space, because the stem needs only to hold the plant shoot until the end of the season. You don't want to over-invest materials or over-engineer a structure beyond what's needed. Now, in the case of a woody stem, that is, the stem of a perennial that persists and grows over the course of many seasons, these stems are there for the long haul. Xylem and phloem that we make this year will still be in use, transporting materials throughout the plant next year and the year after that. And so more investment is perfectly appropriate for perennial or woody stems for reasons that just aren't there for the stems of an annual plant. Year after year, the perennial plant grows larger and the stem needs to become stronger to support the plant's weight, while at the same time it needs to be able to transport a larger amount of materials. The bigger plant needs to have more stuff transported from the shoots to the roots and from the roots to the shoots. Both of these outcomes are achieved by increasing the cross-sectional area of the stem with the addition of more wood, that is, xylem cells, with their ability to transport water and mineral nutrients, as well as their heavily reinforced cell walls that allow them to support weight. Phloem increases as well, but not nearly as much as the xylem. If you think of the trunk of a large tree, the vast majority of that cross-sectional area is xylem. Wood is xylem. And in a large tree, the majority of that xylem is heartwood. Actually no longer functional for transporting stuff. No longer carrying water and minerals from the roots to the shoots. The sole function of the heartwood is to support the tree's massive weight. And in order to do this, it must resist being rotted out or eaten by bugs. As you might expect, the heartwood is toward the center of the tree trunk, hence heartwood, right? While the xylem closer to the outside is called sapwood, also aptly named because it's still functional as a plant's vasculature, carrying xylem sap from the roots to the crown. Often, you could tell heartwood from sapwood because it's been infiltrated by chemicals that are often darker in color. These chemicals, called extractives, include gums and resins and organic salts that discourage bugs and microbes that would otherwise cause rot. Woodworkers are likely to know all about this. If you're making an outdoor structure out of redwood, you could go to Home Depot and get a cheap grade of redwood, which is usually a little bit red and a little bit yellow. Okay. The yellow part is actually sapwood and is much less resistant to bugs and microbes. Now, alternatively, you could go to a specialist wood supplier and buy a higher grade of redwood that's entirely red, pure heartwood. It's much, much more expensive, but the darker colored heartwood is better able to withstand the pressures of bugs and microbes. Even in a giant tree trunk, the vascular cambium is just a single layer of cells right at the outer limit of the xylem. This is probably where you would draw the distinction between wood and bark. In this case, the innermost part of the bark is phloem, and outside of the phloem, there are various kinds of tissue, depending on the tree, that are produced by another cambial layer, the cork cambium, which is outside of the phloem. You probably couldn't see my air quotes when I was saying bark earlier. They were there because the term bark is unclear. It can also apply just to the layers outside of the phloem. Some trees, like birch and myrtles, shed their bark, but this doesn't mean that they're getting rid of any phloem, right? These kinds of trees are kind of like you in that they produce a layer of dead cells on the outside that can continually be sloughed off and replaced from underneath by fresh material. And this is all happening outside of the phloem by that 
cork cambium that I mentioned earlier. Anyhow, let's turn our attention to some slides now. These will give us a picture of how growth starts in a tree trunk, as well as the general anatomy of wood. We have a prepared slide with cross sections of tilia. That's either a linden tree or a basswood tree, depending on whether we're talking about a European or an American species. But these are young stems. We're looking at a one-year stem, a two-year stem, and a three-year stem. Okay, now the first thing you want to do here is to connect what we're looking at with the Metacago stem that we looked at last week. Right? Xylem cells inside, then vascular cambium, then phloem cells outside of the vascular cambium. Of course, there's going to be a lot more xylem. By the time the tree is a big trunk, the xylem will go all the way to the middle of the stem. But in these young stems, probably side branches actually, you can see that there's still an airspace with pithy stuff right in the middle. But in proportion, uh, it's still smaller than that big open space we saw in the middle of the herbaceous stem, Metacago. Now, zooming in just a bit, so now we're on low power, 100x total magnification. We can look more carefully at the xylem. Right? Stems generally start their growth in the spring. This could be when the seedling is sprouting up, or if it's a side branch, this would be when the bud on the parent stem wakes up and starts to grow into its own stem. Now for the early part of the year, that's the springtime, there's plenty of water. But as spring moves into summer, there's less water. Less water and even less until we get to the fall, where this being a seasonally deciduous tree stops growing entirely and loses its leaves. Now, I'm not exactly sure when the stem was cut, but it looks like it was at least close to the end of the summer because there's quite a lot of summer wood. Oh, and by the way, there are two terms here that you want to know about. Spring wood, in the spring, and summer wood. I think it's pretty obvious what the difference is in terms of when they're produced, but the way you can tell them apart is by the size of the xylem cells. The xylem, when it's made, forms around a living xylem cell. The cell wall, it becomes heavily reinforced with cellulose and lignin. And then when the cell wall is completely ready to conduct water, the cell on the inside dies and it's essentially washed away by the flood of water coming through the xylem from the roots, right? And so, yeah, xylem is actually dead tissue. It's basically the dead, hollow shells of the xylem cells that's conducting the water through the xylem. Now, in the springtime, when there's a lot more water, the living xylem cells, they grow to a much larger size. And so the cell walls make a bigger circle when you cut them in cross-section. During the summer, when water is less available, the xylem cells don't inflate to such large size, and so the xylem tubes that they form tend to be smaller. And so you can tell spring wood by its larger xylem cells compared to summer wood where you find smaller size tubes. Now you also know that summer wood is produced later, and therefore to the outside of the spring wood. And so you have this gradation of spring wood with a bigger xylem closer to the center of the tree, gradually, more or less gradually, getting smaller as things become progressively drier between spring and summer. After the summer, you have the fall when growth stops and the plant loses its leaves until the next spring. This tilia stem, it could have been cut right at the end of summer, mid-autumn, or even in the last stages of winter, and it would look the same. The vascular cambium is just sitting right here, inactive, making no more xylem, no more phloem, just waiting out the winter to begin growth again the next spring. Okay, now let's look at the two-year stem, and here is where the vascular cambium was stuck in the fall and winter after that first year of growth. And then it woke up 
to find itself in the springtime with abundant water and it starts to produce new xylem cells, which will be the larger caliber springwood cells, right? So this darker area, the growth ring, marks the position of the vascular cambium during that long period of no growth. And it also marks the boundary between the summer wood from the year before and the spring wood from the year after. You can see pretty nicely how the summer wood is different. You don't have any of those really big xylem cells. Now let's look at the three-year stem. The stretch between growth rings represents one season. Here, the second year of growth. Spring and summer. Spring wood on the inside grades gradually into summer wood on the outside. Isn't that neat? I think so. So um, we know that this stem was cut in its third year. But do you think this stem was cut at the very end of its growing season? What do you think? Now let's look outside the vascular cambium. This is obviously where the xylem ends, right? And let's see if you can see the phloem, right? Yeah, these blocks of phloem, they have the shape of a trapezoid, wider at the base, tapering to a narrow top. It's the part closer to the outside. Now think about this for a moment and see if you can't figure out why the phloem is shaped like this. Why trapezoidal? All right, the thing to think about here is where is the youngest phloem in the block and where is the oldest phloem? Well, yeah, the youngest phloem is the stuff closest to the vascular cambium toward the inside part of the phloem. Now on the outside, at the narrow top of the trapezoid, you actually have the oldest phloem, which was produced when the stem was much smaller when the vascular cambium was still a circle, but a circle of much smaller circumference. It was around here. Okay. And consequently, there's a much smaller circle of phloem that was produced at that time, which got pushed toward the outside as the stem grew larger and larger, you know, with the deposition of more xylem. The circumference grows, the overall cross-sectional area grows. Now remember that xylem and phloem are terminally differentiated cells. So once this old phloem was made, there would be no further cell divisions. The phloem had to split apart. This was necessary in order to allow the stem to increase in cross-sectional area. Now we've got these triangular shaped spaces in between the blocks of phloem, and they had to get filled in by new cells, and these cells were produced by the cork cambium. Okay. Uh, cork cambium is responsible for all the tissues that's outside of the phloem, forming the remainder of the bark. Okay. Don't worry about this for this lab. We're going to be concerned entirely about the xylem and the phloem and the vascular cambium, but don't worry about anything produced by the cork cambium. Right. Now before we move on from the slide, I do want you to think about the xylem and the heartwood and how it's going to be infiltrated by all those resins and other extractives that will make the heartwood rot resistant. How do those chemicals get into the middle part of the trunk? Remember that all of the xylem are the empty cell walls of xylem cells that died long ago. There's no living cellular stuff there. All the metabolic activity in the tree trunk is going to be on the outside from those youngest xylem cells that are still alive and outward. You've got the vascular cambium, the phloem, and the various cells outside of the phloem. This is where the chemicals form and from this outside part of the tree near the skin these chemicals need to be conducted to the center part of the tree. And here's where we come to the next important structure for you to focus on as we look at the wood samples because in addition to the xylem cells which are actually just the cell walls that conduct water through the xylem. You also have xylem vascular rays, like rays of the sun. 
they emanate from the inside, from the center, to the outside. If the cross section is a circle, these rays would be radii. Now these vascular rays are the third of three important landmarks we've talked about that we can use to navigate our way through wood. The first landmark is the xylem cells themselves. They're always fairly long and tubular, and these tubes always run up and down the stem. That's why when you're looking at a cross section like this, the xylem cells will look like little thick walled circles, and they also make up almost all of the wood. The vascular rays, they run from the center to the outside, actually from the outside to the center. And therefore, they run orthogonally at right angles to the xylem cells, which run up and down. Now, the growth rings are concentric circles in the stem cross section, you know, where the vascular cambium was during that period of fall and winter. These concentric circles, if you think about it, are orthogonal at 90 degree angles to both the vascular rays, which go inside to the outside, and also to the xylem cells, which go up and down. Okay. See that? Three landmark structures, growth rings, vascular rays, xylem cells. Learn to recognize them, and once you do, you can tell the direction the tree was growing and the plane in which the tree was cut in order to get that piece of wood that you are reading. Now you have to look at the stem as a three-dimensional figure, like in a geometry class. It's a cylinder. The tubular xylem cells run parallel with the axis of the cylinder. The vascular rays are perpendicular to the xylem cells, and specifically, they run in a direction from the center to the outside. In other words, radii. The growth rings are actually concentric cylinders that are orthogonal to the vascular rays. Yeah? Seen that? Okay, now the more cynical people among you may be thinking, why are we doing this? Well, this is actually a great exercise in three-dimensional spatial thinking. You're developing skill in visualizing the whole structure from microscopic preparations. Later on, I'm willing to bet, you'll be needing to do exactly this in various contexts, like with animal structures in anatomy class or developmental biology class. In order to understand what's going on in the slide you're looking at, you need to visualize the whole three-dimensional structure and the plane in which the slice was taken. And this is much harder to do with animals than with plants. These wood slides are actually a great exercise for developing those spatial skills because the landmark features are all more or less linear and at right angles to each other. So no, I don't expect that you'll ever need any expertise at all in interpreting little slices of wood. And yet, the experience of doing this will actually advance your readiness for those maddening animal slides you'll be seeing in a future class. Now there are three sections we'll be analyzing. Wood slices can be cut in different planes in our cylindrical tree trunk. Now these little slices that we'll be looking at are approximately square in shape and taken from a large enough trunk such that the growth rings are effectively planar. You don't want to rely on the curvature of a growth ring to determine which way is in and which way is out. One section we'll be looking at is the transverse section, which is also sometimes called a cross section. Okay. This is in the plane perpendicular to the axis of growth. We looked at this kind of section for the stem and root slides last week, and also on the tilia slides we were looking at earlier. Only here, we're just looking at a tiny square of xylem, not the entire stem. What direction do the xylem cells run? And so how are they going to look on a transverse section? 
now within one year's worth of growth. You should see the oldest springwood xylem near to one growth ring grading into summer wood that ends with another growth ring. All right? So, which direction is the tree growing? Now, I like to ask this in the form of what direction would you need to tunnel in order to get out of the tree through the shortest possible route? In order to answer this, you need to know which direction the xylem growth is occurring, because that should give you the closest path to the outside of the tree. Now, also on the transverse section, you should be seeing vascular rays, and these should be parallel to the direction you decided to tunnel to get out of the tree. Now, if you can visualize all of this happening, you're definitely looking at a transverse section. The other two sections are longitudinal, meaning they're in a plane that's parallel with the axis of growth. Here, you're not gonna see the xylem cells cut across. They'll be cut the long way, and this will be the dominant tissue. The xylem is gonna be the dominant tissue. The difference between the two sections are whether the cut is made coplanar with the radius, and this will be the radial section, or is the cut made perpendicular to that plane? In other words, coplanar with the growth rings. And this would be a tangential section. Now this should be pretty easy to remember. The radial section is coplanar with the radius, while the tangential section is in a plane that is tangential with the concentric cylinders that are the growth rings. Now let's think first about the radial section. Xylem cells run up and down, but the vascular rays will run perpendicular, right? We're looking at a radial plane cut, so the vascular rays are going to run side to side. Okay. Now, this, what I'm showing you here, is a hunk of yellow pine, ponderosa, I think. I collected it from a wood pile near Palomar Mountain. It's still got its outside, the bark is still there, and there are two sawn surfaces. But here's the face I want you to see. This is a natural split. I don't know if you've ever split wood. You know, good productive activity of the robust outdoorsy type. You stand a short section of a log and you split it with an axe or a wedge. Now if you've ever done this, you'll know that wood likes to split along certain planes. And those planes are always radial. And that's because it's the vascular rays that make the wood easier to split. Here you can see the vascular rays without the aid of the microscope. The actual xylem vessels go up and down, but the vascular rays go side to side. Now keep this in mind when we look at the wood under the microscope. Now when you're looking at the radial section under the microscope, you might also be able to see darkish growth rings demarking a sudden transition from summer wood from the year before and spring wood of the year after. Okay, now, using the same logic as before, you should be able to tell me which direction you would tunnel in order to get out of the tree through the shortest possible path. Okay, now, this is going to be a little bit more difficult in the radial section than it is in the transverse section, but in some slides, you can totally do it, okay? Now, in the tangential section, you're gonna see xylem cells running up and down, of course, but instead of the vascular rays going side to side, now with the tangential cut, you should be seeing vascular rays coming straight at you. That's because they're cut obliquely in a plane that's perpendicular to the vascular rays, right? Also, since we're more or less parallel with the growth rings, we don't really see them. And we also can't tell which way is the shortest path to the outside of the tree. It would have to be either towards you or away from you because that's the direction that the vascular rays are aligned. But you can't tell whether we're looking at the slice from the inside or from the outside, right? Outside looking in, you'd want to tunnel towards you. Inside looking out, you'd want to tunnel away from you can't tell. Right. 
Now, I hope that makes sense to you. If not, you can rewind the tape and go over it again. Or not. It's entirely okay for you to jump into the practice that we have later and see if that helps. That part's coming in just a bit. There's one more thing I've got to do, and that's to introduce another dichotomy. Softwood trees versus hardwood trees. Now, first thing to note is that this is not really related to softness or hardness of the wood. Sure, pine and redwood are both pretty soft as woods go, and they are soft woods, but balsa, you know, the craft wood, it's even softer than pine, and it's a hardwood. Okay. And then you've got slow-growing pines like the bristlecone. They have wood that's incredibly hard and dense, and yet it's a softwood. Okay. The distinction between softwood and hardwood is entirely taxonomic. Any wood coming from a flowering plant is a hardwood. Any wood of a gymnosperm is a softwood. Okay, that's it. Now we're going to be looking at transverse sections, radial sections, and tangential sections of a pine, Pinus strobus, which is white pine, a softwood. And we're also going to be looking at those same sections from white oak, Quercus alba which is a hardwood. Now the way to tell hardwoods from softwoods microscopically is by looking at the xylem cells themselves because they're way different. The xylem of hardwoods will have long tubular vessels like mini PVC pipes that are built around xylem cells that are stacked in cylinders. Think of a stack of Coca-Cola cans. Each can is a vessel element a derived xylem structure that was made from a single xylem cell that was shaped like a Coca-Cola can. And this is unique to flowering plants. The oak, being an angiosperm, has them. The pine, being a gymnosperm, doesn't. Now in softwoods like the pine, the xylem is going to be composed entirely of long tapered units called tracheids. Each tracheid like a vessel element, was its own xylem cell, and it has its own xylem wall. But it doesn't stack up with others to make a perfect tube, you know, like after the tops and bottoms of the Coca-Cola cans get blasted out, right? That's what happens in an angiosperm. Instead, you've got the tapered ends of each tracheid overlapping with the tapered ends of other tracheids above and below. And water passes from one tracheid to the next, through bordered pits, little holes connecting the tracheids where they taper together, allowing the flow of water up the stem of the gymnosperm. Now in the radial section of the pine, you should be seeing the bordered pits pretty nicely. They kind of look like pink donuts. So if you see vessel elements forming a tubular xylem vessel, you're definitely looking at a hardwood. If you see no vessel elements, it must be a softwood. Now don't use the presence absence of tracheids as a guide because a lot of hardwoods, including the oak, right? They have tracheids in addition to the vessel elements. You want to go with the presence absence of vessel elements. Present, angiosperm, hardwood. Absent, gymnosperm, softwood. All right? Okay, here we go. So take a look at this slide and tell me, let's start with hardwood or softwood. Okay. Are you seeing anything that look like those vessel elements that kind of um, are coming from stacked up Coca-Cola cans? Yeah. All right. Um, so you should also be seeing side to side matter you know, things running side to side what are those can you see them okay the majority of the cells here are going up and down those would be what the ones going side to side would be what 
All right, now uh, right here is a growth ring. There's a, it's a break between spring wood uh, from this from the uh, spring afterwards after the, the winter and summer wood at the end of the year before. Okay. Now, uh, given that's the growth ring, which direction do you tunnel in order to get out of the tree through the shortest possible path? All right, now let's move on to a different slide. Okay, this is the same plant. This is the same kind of tree. It's uh, the white oak, if you haven't figured that out yet. Right? Now, what kind of section is this? What are these big holes, big circles that are there in the majority of the slide? Okay. Um, what structure have we talked about that will look like a lot of big circles cut in a particular plane. Okay. You figured out whether it's a transverse section, a radial section, or a tangential section yet. Okay. Now one thing, um, maybe you've already seen it, is that we've got a one-year growth period going from right around here to around here. Those are those are growth rings. Okay, now, which direction do you go in order to tunnel out of the tree through the shortest possible path? Okay, now, can you see vascular rays here? Which direction do they run? Up and down or right and left? Remember that the vascular rays have got to be orthogonal at right angles to the growth rings. Okay. Now, uh, this will probably give away the answer, but uh, way over on the right-hand side, you can actually see a gigantic vascular ray. You've got a lot of little ones um, throughout the entire slide, but way over on the right, you've got an enormous vascular array with lots of cells that are going in the up and down direction. Okay, and so uh, now we're going to be moving over to the third slide, which must be a tangential section. Yeah. Okay. So given that this is a tangential section, can you see the vascular rays? They're pointing right at you. Because that's the direction that the vascular rays point if you're looking at a tangential section, right? Uh, and you could actually see the little ones, those little vascular rays that we saw in the previous slide. Uh, they're coming right at you, but you've also got a couple of gigantic vascular rays um, in the slide as well, right? And, and again, because we're looking at a tangential section, you can't tell which direction is out of the tree through the shortest possible route. Okay, we uh, went through that before. All right, now let's switch over to the other slide. This is the uh, pine, right? Now, given that this is pine, gymnosperm, and therefore, what do we not expect to see? Rhymes with bessel elements, right? Okay, now, um, we should be seeing only tracheids, and this is exactly what only tracheids looks like. This is what a softwood looks like under the microscope. Yeah, they're mostly uniform in size. We don't see any of those large, big circles coupled with smaller circles. That's kind of like the characteristic that you find in angiosperms. Now, um, we do see some of these larger holes, right? But they don't look xylemy at all. They don't have thick walls. They are round. They're in, they're in the wood. But we also know about pine. Uh, one of the things we know about pine is that they have a lot of pitch or resiny material in the wood. And so what we're looking at there is a resin duct. Uh, this is where the pitch is stored. kind of helps the tree protect itself against um, marauding herbivores. Okay. Now there, uh, you can totally see the growth ring. I'm not even going to point it out to you. 
and given that we've got a growth ring that separates the year's growth from the you know the, the summer growth from the year before the summer wood from the year before with the spring wood we're basically jumping across a fall and a winter to get to the spring wood what direction is this tree growing okay so now we'll move over to another section also of the pine okay and uh, see the growth ring I do okay um, now which direction do you tunnel in order to get out of this slide out of this tree um, for the shortest possible path right and prepare yourself to answer a question like that it's, it gets part of that spatial um, development that we're shooting for with this laboratory okay so the vascular rays are totally going side to side now there's one thing that often kind of you know distracts students when they look at this particular kind of section um, and that's these diagonal uh, stripes you see that look like little uh, candy cane stripes um, you can pay attention to them uh, they're kind of interesting because those represent the ends of the tracheids and being at the ends of the tracheids they're the parts where the tracheids overlap if we zoom in on them we'll do that right now zooming in on those uh, diagonal stripes uh, and realizing they're not really anything xylemy or um, or vascular ray like or growth ringy um, this is actually looking at the boundary between adjacent tracheids and you could actually see the bordered pits and I promise you they do look like um, pink donuts and they do yeah great now uh, last is the tangential section and sure enough uh, this point this should be feeling a lot more comfortable to you you can see the vascular rays are pointing right out at you let me zoom in to show you that a little closer and uh, and given that this is a tangential section you are not going to be able to tell which direction is out to the shortest possible path okay that's all that I have for today um, interesting challenge I hope you had fun with it